Good morning. We greet you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Lord's house as we come together today for worship. Let me uh, remind you of things that are happening in the life of the church that you want to plug into, especially this week. Uh, we'll have a regular meet at the gates. Um, also, Tuesday night, we'll have the Ladies Mystery Fellowship Dinner. We talked about that last week, but uh, that's at 6.30 p.m., and you, you should get your assignments at some point. Uh, for that, ladies, for wh which mystery location you'll be uh, dining with and the mystery people there. Um, and then Wednesday night will be a regular night of activities. That will begin with uh, King's Kids at 4 p.m., followed by uh, dinner at 5.45, and then uh, youth group, the adult prayer meeting, uh, and Cata Kids will all be happening at their, their regular times. Also included on Wednesday night will be the conclusion of the Mommy and Me Summer Bible Study uh, as well, so, so plan on that. Uh, things that are coming up uh, this coming weekend, the Father-Son Rich Haven Conference. You can see Pastor Dodds or uh, Mr. Reeves for more details on that. Um, Lord willing, next uh, Sunday will be a, a College Plus lunch uh, at the Robbins house. We'll see how that goes because Pastor Robbins is actually under the weather uh, today. Um, he, he's recovering from an illness, and uh, so we're doing an audible. And so instead of Pastor Robbins, you're going to get Pastor Dodds and Pastor Anderson today. So if any of you needs to get up and walk out right now, this is your time to do it. It'll be awkward for us, but that we understand. And uh, so pray for Pastor Robbins that he gets well uh, quickly and is back uh, in the pulpit. Uh, other things happening, um, August 31st will be the meeting with uh, Anna Wontrop, um, uh, the wife of... Um, uh, Pastor Ben Wantrop, who serves at All Saints Presbyterian in Newcastle, uh, will be at the Skellinger's home. And so put that on your schedule. Also, that uh, the 31st will be Guys Night with Pastor King. And then the coming weekend uh, will be on uh, September 1st and 2nd will be the Marriage and Parenting Conference for Young Families. And if you haven't signed up for that, you want to do that uh, as soon as possible. There's, there's meal tickets to purchase as a part of that. Uh, and we want to be, have a good handle on child care. Also, if you are not a young family, uh, we would love it if you would be able to help out with uh, children, um, with, with uh, either helping out the younger students or with the young children in the nursery. Uh, we need a number of, of child care workers for that. And you can check on the ladies' Facebook page or check the email that went out from the church and, and respond to that. That would be most uh, appreciated. Uh, and then, of course, coming up is the Labor Day picnic. That will go from 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, surely that's on your schedule already, and you'll plan to be a part of that. Um, I do want to remind you about the, the Christmas choir kickoff. Kickoff is at September 8th uh, and 9th, and so you want to take note of that if you're part of planning for that. I know that sounds crazy. We're talking about the Christmas choir already, uh, but it begins early to be done well, and so, uh, so put that on your calendar. Uh, you can check your bulletin for the other details about other things that are happening uh, in the life of the church. There's a, a multitude of those things that are out there and that are waiting for us, and you want to be aware of those. But Today, if you're a visitor with us, we're delighted that you're, you've chosen to worship here at Woodruff Road. Uh, we want to encourage you to do a couple of things. Uh, if you look in front of you in the pew rack, there's a blue visitor information card. Uh, now's a good time to, to, to grab that and fill it out. Uh, you can drop in the offering plate or a gift to myself or, or Pastor uh, Dodds after the service and, and help us get to know you a little bit better. Uh, get to know the congregation better by coming down for fellowship. Everybody will kind of flow down the hallway to your right. If you have kids, get them and then flow down to the right. Um, and uh, we will have refreshments available for you down there. And then stick around for Sunday school. We have a, an excellent visitor Sunday school class. It's a great way to, to get, understand the doctrines of the church. And so that happens right back in the, in the back of the sanctuary in the training room. And so we'll meet back after the lights flicker off down in the fellowship hall. Then you'll make your way back here, drop your kids off, and join for the visitor Sunday school class. Uh, if you're in the youth group, you will be as kind of flipping uh, things around, but you will be with, um, with um, the psalm study uh, with um, Scott Clark uh, in that place. And so, so you're going to redirect there this morning as a part of that as uh, Pastor King is on vacation. And I believe that will conclude our, our announcements this morning. Um, let's now turn our heart towards what we're here for, which is to worship the triune and living God. In Psalm 18, David cries out with these words, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And then he begins to detail a multitude of the reasons in which he is drawn to call upon the name of the Lord. He says it's because he is saved from his enemies. He says it's because God has heard his cries. He says it's because God is awesome and fearful because God has bowed the heavens and come down. We know the, the truth, the greater reality of the Lord's coming down to this earth in the form of our Lord Jesus Christ who took on flesh, our flesh, to identify with us and to be a sacrifice for us. 
Knowing Christ in the way that we know him, it's right for us to call upon the Lord. We do so as we prepare for worship. Hear now as God calls you into his worship from Psalm 34, 8. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Let's now take our Trinity Psalter hymnals. We will turn to hymn number 216. We will stand together and sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty, setting of Psalm 103. That's hymn 216.
Psalm 38, 1 and 2, we read, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. For your arrows have pierced me deeply, and your hands pressed me down. And the reason for the concern of the psalmist is because of sin. It's our concern as well. Let's confess then our sin before God using the form that's printed in our bulletins. O gracious God, we are poor sinners. We were conceived as sinners and are prone to do evil. We transgress repeatedly your holy commandments. Therefore, we have drawn upon ourselves your just condemnation. With true sorrow, we repent of our offenses. Have mercy on us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Remove our guilt and our pollution. Grant us the daily increase of your Holy Spirit that we might mortify sin and produce the fruits of holiness. Have mercy on us for Christ's sake. Amen. The Lord's answer is to have mercy on you for Christ's sake. As we read in Psalm 133 and 4, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Amen. Remain standing. Would you please turn to me for our Old Testament reading to Jonah chapter 1? Not, not what is listed in your bulletin, but to the prophet Jonah in chapter 1. As you turn there, you also want to note the response to the reading of God's word, which is printed in your bulletin. Again, Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we, we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Man shall not live by bread alone. Amen. Please be seated. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul warns the church. He says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. If you listen to the world, it would tell you that the accumulation of stuff is how you would be wise. 
The more you accumulate, the, the wiser you prove yourself to be because you're ready for the day to come. As believers, we're called not to adopt the wisdom of this age, but the wisdom which is from heaven, which says that giving is good and giving to God is especially good. So let us do so now as we seek that invisible kingdom. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we pray that what we give today would truly be for the great cause of exalting our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, give us humility as we give, that we would recognize that what we have is from your hand. And give us joy as we give, because you are a good God to whom we give. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you this morning, Lord, to praise you, our great God, and to give you thanks. For as the world stumbles around in darkness and confusion, you, the God of knowledge, have given your people the clarity of your word for light and truth. As the world goes through life full of anxiety, you give us instead a peace that surpasses all understanding. And as the world goes through life full of sadness and hatred and bitterness, you give us instead joy and love and contentment. Indeed, your mercies to us never cease. Great is your faithfulness to us. For not one word of all your good promises to us has ever failed. They all come to pass. Therefore, we do not put our trust in rulers or any man, but our hope is in you 
the Lord God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, whose understanding is infinite, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, and who brings the way of the wicked to ruin. Oh, the depth of the riches of both your wisdom and knowledge, and how unsearchable are your judgments. Indeed, glory and honor and salvation belong to you, our God. And we thank you that while we were yet dead in our trespasses and sins, and walked according to the course of this world, you, being rich in mercy, and because of your great love for us, saved us and made us alive. We thank you that we are now able to come to you, as we did this morning, and confess our sins, knowing that although the wages we deserve for those sins is death, your gift to us instead is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And Lord, of all the many blessings you have poured out on us, we are especially thankful for our kids. We thank you, the author of life, for the children you have given us. And we ask that you would enable our parents, but also us as a church body, to be faithful in calling them to trust in Christ as their only Savior, and that the Holy Spirit would work true faith in their hearts early in their lives, that they would be a blessing to their families and to your church. We pray also, Lord, for our children who are starting a new school year, whether they are attending school at home or outside the home or leaving home to attend college. We ask that you would help them to use the gifts that you have given them to grow not just in the knowledge of whatever subjects they are, they are studying, but that they would also grow in their faith, in their love, and in their obedience to you. We pray that you would keep them from temptations, and even in all the busyness that comes to school, and all of its many good activities, that you would help them not to forsake meditating on your word, that they would, hi they would hide it in their hearts, that they might not sin against you. And Father, help them to be wise in their choice of friendships as well, and give them those friends who will encourage them in their walk with you. We also now, Lord, thank you for our marriages, and whether they have uh, been married for a day or have been married for many decades, we ask that you would help the husbands and wives here in our church to faithfully, with endurance, sacrificially love each other, that you would protect and strengthen each marriage, and that you would fill our households with joy and with peace. For those who want children, we pray that you would give them the desires of their heart, give them patience, and help them to trust in your plan for them. And for those who desire marriage, we ask that you would help them to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and that it would please you to fulfill their desire also, according to your will. And Lord, we also have many in our congregation who are dealing with trials, either suffering with illness, some who are in need of work, and others who find themselves in very strained family relationships. And so we ask that you would comfort each of them with the knowledge that their sovereign God has limited the time and the manner, the intensity and effects of all their sickness, all their financial or relational struggles, that each pain, each sleepless hour is predestined and each sanctifying result eternally purposed, that we know that nothing great or small escapes the ordaining hand of you, our loving Heavenly Father. And so according to your eternal purposes, we ask that you relieve their pain, provide for them financially, and bring peace to their relationships. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless us, that your mercy would spread through this church and around the world to those who are currently in darkness. Change their hearts of stone to hearts of flesh, save them, and bring many into your kingdom. Build your church, we pray, here in our country, Lord, and in Central and South America, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, and around the world. And as your people gather for worship today, we pray that your church would have peace and be edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, this morning, we'll be shifting our reading for the New Testament. This time, it will come from Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning in verse 35, and we'll continue on through chapter 5 and verse 20. Would you stand once again to give honor to the reading of God's Word from Mark, chapter 4, beginning in verse 35? Mark 4, verse 35, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat 
as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. And he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he, sa for he said to, the, to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. And those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and the country. And they went out to see what, what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. When he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to remain standing, take your Trinity Psalter hymnals and turn to hymn number 213. Remain standing to sing Glory Be to God the Father, hymn 213.
Got the call, call from Carl last night that he was going to need Scotty and I to preach today. And I've never preached a completely spontaneous sermon. Uh, and I'm not going to today either. <laughs> Thought I had you there. Uh, no, today we're going to talk about storms. You see, even what we saw from Jonah 1, the many places in Scripture, God uses storms in the narrative and of his overall program in his kingdom. He uses storms for his purposes. Today we're going to look at two of them, and we've seen them in Mark 4.35 to 5.20. Uh, when I was lived in Florida, I lived there for 16 years, many occasions we were informed that a hurricane was on the way, and we'd immediately begin to track it and assess its potential and the need to, whether we needed to evacuate or not. This happened uh, every year, usually several times. It reminded me of a passage in Ecclesiastes where the preacher used the expression of clouds. It talks about clouds returning after the rain, uh, meaning that this was when one storm was done, another could be seen on a horizon. Uh, today I want to look at two types of storms from the book of Mark, the types of storms that all of you will or are facing currently. Those are storms from without and storms from within. We'll see how Jesus addresses both of them, and I pray that you will be encouraged by what you see. Storms are a part and parcel of life, and especially life in a Genesis 3 world. Uh, some of you young people may not have faced too many storms yet, but they will come. The Lord has promised that. And I don't say that to discourage you. In fact, the reality of life is that uh, there are, even though there are going to be storms, there are ways to address them if you walk with Christ. I hope this sermon is going to be particularly encouraging to you. Uh, despite the fact that we live in this fallen world, we also worship a God who is sovereign over both types of storms, those without and those within. Let's ask the Lord's blessing as we look into the text. Father, apart from your sovereign work and your Holy Spirit's work and to illumine the text before us and to help us to see it, we will miss the point. And I pray that that would not be the case this morning. Uh, each one here today faces some kind of storm. It might be a small one right now. It might be one they see in the horizon. It might be in the middle of the storm right now. But I pray that as we reflect on the words of these narratives and we see Jesus in the middle of them, that we would see him in the middle of our own. And we pray this for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Scotty read the two narratives we're going to look at this morning. Perhaps you've already gathered how they fit into what I just said about storms without and storms within. But let me spell it out. What do these texts have in common? Well, they both deal with people in very desperate circumstances. Uh, in 435 to 41, we have the story of Jesus uh, uh, and his disciples on a boat, they're crossing the Sea of Galilee when a massive storm front comes through and threatens to capsize the boat. Here we have a storm uh, being created from the outside, but it's going to create a storm within the disciples as they're troubled and when they see this thing happen. In 5, 1 through 20, we see a man tormented by demons in a manner that seemingly all hope is lost for him. He's relegated to living in tombs, wandering about, screaming and cutting himself. Uh, he has a storm within, and that's creating storms without as he interacts with other people. The second theme we find in both of these is the theme of faith. Um, we'll see faith addressed in both of them and learn something of what God requires of us when we face our own desperate circumstances. And the third theme that we see, and of course we can find more, but the third theme, of course, is Jesus. We're going to see Jesus and how he addresses both of these situations. And when we're through, I hope and trust and pray that we'll find great encouragement as we face our own storms. The first storm we want to look at is in 435 to 41. Of course, it's a familiar story. I don't know about you, but this is one of those stories I could read every day and just love it. Uh, I think it's like Daniel in the lion's den or Elijah and the prophets of Baal or Elisha and the chariots of fire. They're just so pregnant with meaning and with application. Uh, they're just wonderful. And I don't mean, when I say story, I don't mean a made-up story or myth. It's a narrative. It's a true uh, occasion that took place, but one that just uh, gives us so much to draw from. In the book of Mark, this is where, of course, we're looking at in the book of Mark, although we will draw from other Gospels. 
It's been a long day in the life of Jesus. He is pressed by large crowds and he preached from a boat because, because of all the crowds pushing in on him. Uh, he's dealing with rising threats of those who were his enemies. He's extremely tired and he says to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side. Going to sea is certainly a place to get away from crowds, though even here the text tells us that there were other boats with them. So there, it wasn't just Jesus and his boat, but others that went with them. And they are on the Sea of Galilee. That, that sea is 700 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by steep mountains and hills. Valleys between the mountains create a kind of a tunneling effect for the winds off the Mediterranean to the west or the desert to the east. So the storms can arise very quickly. In this case, we're not looking at a standard storm. Uh, the text tells us it was literally, it was a great or literally a mega storm. <clears throat> and even the seasoned fishermen feared for their lives. The boat these men were in was a fishing boat. In recent, in recent years, archaeologists have discovered boats like this along the shores of Galilee, estimated, or they found them, they estimate, back to the first century. Uh, and it's likely similar to the ones that the disciples used, it's about 27 feet long. I was trying to think of how many pews that would be, maybe nine pews long. And imagine the disciples in there with Jesus. Their boat is not just being tossed to and fro, but it's actually taking on water. And uh, to exacerbate the problem, it's at night. There's no sign of the storms letting up. It's a violent windstorm. High waves are crashing against either side of the boat. The men's nails probably are being ripped out as they're holding on to the planking and the sides of the boat as it's being tossed and turned everywhere. And they're, they're frightened, they're just uh, terror stricken that they're going to be flipping into the sea into a watery grave. So they turn to Jesus for help and there he is, sleeping in the back of the boat, his head on a sandbag likely used for ballast. I, I cannot help but recall R.C. Sproul describing the situation where he says, and there's Jesus in the back of the boat or in the boat uh, sleeping in tranquil repose. That's the words he used. How would you interpret Jesus calm? How is it that he could sleep in the middle of a storm like that? Well, there's several ways we can interpret it, but the disciples' thinking takes a dark turn. They actually rebuke Jesus by accusing him of not caring about them. Now, maybe before we're too hard on them, we can all relate to what they're feeling. I would imagine most here have gone through some kind of storms. You've had those moments where you consider the possibility that maybe Jesus doesn't even care. How does Jesus respond to their rebuke? Well, he responds with two rebukes of his own. The first one is when Jesus rebukes the wind and the sea and he commands them, peace, be still, literally be muzzled. Uh, can you just imagine for a moment what that looked like? We have a tendency to just read those stories. Well, that was cool. That must have been really neat. And we move on to the next text. But if you stop and think about that, in the blink of an eye, the storm is just gone. Absolute stillness all around them. Maybe they hear just some little waves hitting the side of the boat. Maybe they hear a bird. I mean, from this, this violence to this absolute stillness is just mind-boggling. The disciples gather themselves in their wits. As they gather themselves in their wits, the magnitude of what's just happened begins to dawn on them. They look at each other in bewilderment, and they turn their eyes to Jesus, unsure of what to say. You see, up to this point, the disciples have seen Jesus do some healings. He's cast out demons. But now we're in what seems to be a whole new category of miracles, at least in terms of magnitude. But Jesus is not done. He issues a second rebuke, and this time he directs it to the disciples. He asks, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? <clears throat> well, what are the disciples feeling at this moment. The text tells us their fear now exceeds that of the fear created by the storm. It's a fear of the unknown. And it's interesting that they don't answer him. I think probably because they're in shock. And probably because they've realized that something, someone bigger than the megastorm 
is in the boat with them. And so they don't answer him. They don't even talk to him. They don't ask him, how did you do that? Instead, they look at each other and they ask, who is this? It's interesting that Mark uses that word mega three times. The first we saw uh, as the description of the storm. The second is in verse 39 where we read that the wind ceased and there was a mega calm. And now in verse 41 we encounter the word a third time. This time Mark uses it to describe the fear of the disciples. They mega fear Jesus. It's of course it's a reverential fear that recognizes the glory of and the majesty, and the power, and the omnipotence of God against the finitude and helplessness of men. So let me ask you, what storm are you facing right now? What circumstances are you in that you would like to see changed? What situation are you facing that's causing a storm inside you that seems beyond your control? Your job, your neighbors, your family, the economy, Are you clinching onto the sides of your boat and just trying to hold on? Do you feel like Jesus is sleeping and doesn't care? If so, your situation is not unique. You're not the first one. The disciples were there. We see it right here. Frankly, many of our brothers and sisters here have gone through those times, perhaps are in them themselves. But what would the Lord have you do? Well, we see it in the text here. Trust him. That is, that's what Jesus said to the disciples. Remember, Who is in the situation with you? The one who said he will never leave you or forsake you. Remember that even though Jesus was with them, they were still in a storm. His presence is not a guarantee of smooth sailing, but his presence should also bring a calm within you. As you remember that he is the one who brought the storm. He brought them into the storm and he created the storm. It was Jesus' idea to cross the lake. But just as he brought them into the storm, he's also going to remove the storm when he's done with it. Your calling is to remember who is with you in the storm and to trust him. Our second story takes place on the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee. And if our previous story illustrates, uh, illustrated threats and violence and chaos from without, this one will deal with violence and chaos from within. Jesus and his men have crossed the Sea of Galilee. They're now in the land of the Gadarenes. And Jesus hardly has a moment to put his feet on shore when a man accosts him. But it's not just any man. Now, if I were to ask you who in the Bible has suffered more than anyone else, who is the most miserable, pitiable person in the Bible, most of you, I imagine, would say, well, it's got to be Job. But I'd ask you to reconsider that. I wonder if this man might give Job a run for his money in the category of the most miserable, pitiable person in the Bible. Both men, in this case, Job and the demoniac, um, their conflict comes from satanic sources, we're told that. But whereas Job's suffering is due to the painful physical afflictions from outside by Satan, this man is tormented on the inside by a legion of demons such that He even afflicts himself. Now, the previous demon possession in Mark Mark is found in Mark 1, but that was one demon, which is bad enough, of course. I recognize that. In this case, the demon gives his name as legion. Now, a Roman legion is between 5,600 and 6,000 men, and we're not necessarily saying that that's how many demons possess this man. Uh, It could just mean that there were a lot. Uh, the, The demon could have been saying, there are a lot of us in here. But it's a different magnitude of demonic activity than they have seen so far. You ever seen a nature show where the carcass of an animal is in the water just being shredded by piranha? The water around the animal is boiling with the vicious lunging of the fish as they devour their prey. That's the picture here. It's a kind of a feeding frenzy of demons on this man. But he's not devoured. When we slow down and think of what it was like for this man, we feel more than pity. It actually just makes us sick to our stomach. And he's being driven mad by it. And no one can do anything for him. The townspeople have tried to confine him with chains or ropes or shackles, but he is so strong, apparently strengthened by the presence of the demons, or maybe the demons themselves, even the 
those kinds of means were ineffective to restrain him. The efforts of the demonic oppression are evident, you know, the effects of the demonic oppression are evident. He has superhuman strength, he lives in a graveyard, he cries out as he runs among the tombs and he cuts himself. In Matthew, we're told that he's so violent that the people avoid the area. When Mark writes that the man could not be tamed, he uses a word that's typically used of taming wild beasts. It's hard to imagine a much worse scenario. Let's be candid here and admit that the subject of demon possession is so far from most of our experiences. But if you believe this book to be God's word, then the reality of this scene, the grotesqueness of the man's situation, the hopelessness, the despair, the terror generated by the presence of something so evil, it just paints a gruesome picture. How does the man react when he or Legion sees Jesus? He immediately runs to Jesus and falls at his feet in a posture of worship and submission. What a picture. Now it's hard to tell where the man leaves off and where the demons begin, so we won't try to understand the mechanics of the interaction of the two. It's interesting that the first time he speaks, he speaks in the singular, and the second time he speaks in the plural, we. The demons call out and identify Jesus, and they ask why he's there. Now, something that we read in a parallel passage in Matthew 8.29, we read that the demons ask him, have you come here to torment us before the time? <clears throat> what is the time? <clears throat> well, most likely it refers to the end time, to judgment. These demons are aware that such a day is coming and are suggesting that Jesus is early. Well, they are right that it's not time for the eternal judgment. They are wrong if they think that Jesus cannot exercise his authority over them until that time. And so the demons, not wanting to be destroyed, they ask him permission to send them into a herd of swine nearby, about 2,000 pigs were told. He grants the request and the demons enter the herd and the text tells us the pigs run violently over the cliffs and into the, over a steep edge and into the sea and they're drowned. Have you ever come upon the scene of an accident and you stand there and you try to figure it out? We do this sometimes with the kids and I. We drive along and you see here's the ambulance, here's the fire truck, and here's two or three cars, and you're saying, well, it looks like that guy did that, and this guy did this, and that's how we try to recreate that scenario. Imagine doing that here. Imagine yourself, you're one of the townspeople, and all of a sudden you hear a loud commotion. People are yelling. You look over and you see this 2,000 pigs running towards the sea and disappearing and dying. They plunge over the edge. They disappear. What would you think? Your eye then is drawn to another scene where you see the man who for years perhaps has been so violent, so abusive, so vile that everyone intentionally and carefully avoids him. They give him a wide path leaving no possibility for an encounter and here he is still probably with scabs and some bleeding but now clothed, sitting and in his right mind and talking to someone that you've never seen before. You turn your attention to the man he's talking to, and you realize that he's the one that's brought this whole thing about. You look at the aftermath of 2,000 pigs inexplicably dead. The man that the whole town could not subdue is completely freed, and just from a word of this stranger, well, that is all they need to see to be paralyzed with fear. Again, asking, who is this man? In this case, they don't want to know. All they know is they want him to go away. The thought of someone like this with such power is frightening to them, and they ask him to leave. They plead with him to leave. Now, go back to the formerly demon-possessed man. We read in the account that he's now clothed and in his right mind. Does that sound familiar? To me, it's reminiscent of the story of Nebuchadnezzar. If you remember in the book of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar was just bloated with pride. And God humbles him for a time, and he goes out into the wilderness, and he lives like a wild man out in the fields. But what does Scripture say happened to him? In Daniel 4.34, we read, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, 
lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. Isn't that an incredible picture? It's the overall picture of scripture. Coming to Christ restores your sanity. It brings peace. It's not until we turn our eyes to Christ that we will have understanding. Because as we learn from Ecclesiastes, there's no, nothing meaningful under the sun apart from God's existence. So here's this man now, sitting clothed and in his right mind. And the story closes, as the story closes, he pleads with Jesus to go with him. Uh, by, the word, the word, by the way, the word plead there is the same one that's used, the same Greek word used by the demons when they plead with Jesus to let them go into the swine. And interestingly, Jesus says to the man, no. Uh, why does he say no to the man? Well, it appears that Jesus wants to leave a witness in this Gentile region. To the man's credit, he does just what Jesus asks of him. Look at verses 19 and 20. Jesus did not permit him, but he said to him, go to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. So let me ask you, what inner conflicts are you fighting now? Now, of course, we don't believe that believers can be demon-possessed. But I think the point here can be made from the greater to the lesser. If Jesus can heal a man like this, <clears throat> if he can restore him to his right mind, what can he do for you? Maybe you are paralyzed by fear, fear of people, fear of financial setback, or even fear of the future as you read the news Maybe you're anxious about a relationship or a job change. Maybe you're confused and can't get clarity about a decision. Maybe you're struggling or perhaps failing to overcome your lust or same-sex attraction. Maybe it's resentment, bitterness, guilt, loneliness, sadness, doubt, boredom, self-sufficiency, pride, or despair. We could write a catalog of options, but the answer will be the same for each of them. Do you want sanity? Do you want inner peace? Then you have to go to the one who is Lord of all of those. The man in the boat went to Jesus. The demoniac went to Jesus. Will you? Imagine thousands of demons, and they cower before Jesus, asking for his permission. <clears throat> That's your Lord. That's your king. That's your savior. How do we apply these passages? We've made some applications already. Let me add some more to these. It probably goes without saying, but bears repeating that there is more going on here than the storm and the swine. The disciples, the townspeople, and we are, and we <clears throat> are being introduced to the God-man. Perhaps many of us, because we're so familiar with these stories or with Jesus, that we Take him too lightly. And it takes a narrative like these, considered more closely and with deeper reflection, to remind us of just who he is. When we reflect on what is happening in these narratives, when we take time to deeperly think on their significance, we should be, um, should be shaken. The disciples didn't respond to Jesus. They just sat there in abject fear. The people of the gatherings didn't even take time to think about what happened. They just wanted Jesus out of there. They plead, sometimes translated, implored him to leave. Why? Because Jesus didn't fit into their categories. <clears throat> we don't have a name for this. He was a terrifying mystery, and therefore he was a threat to them. What about you? Have you become so familiar with Jesus that you take him for granted? Do you really think that if you were in his presence right now that you wouldn't be shaken to the core of your being and at the same time and just wrapped and raptured beyond comprehension? Maybe this morning you need a fresh look at the Savior. You need to be reminded of just who he is who has come, you've come to worship this morning. Another application. I recall one of my teachers, Greg Bonson, who was one of the greatest apologists that I've ever met. Bonson was once asked if he ever doubted God's existence. Here's a man who 
debated on the issue of does God exist. And he was asked, well, do you ever doubt that? Well, Bonson had gone through a number of hardships himself, a number of physical hardships. I believe he had two open heart surgeries. And I've long reflected on his answer when he was asked that question. He actually died of those infirmities later on. But I remember his answer to that question. He says, I've never doubted the existence of God, but I have wondered at times if he loved me. This echoes the cry of the disciples in the boat, thinking he just, he doesn't care. But what's the underlying assumption? It's it's that if Jesus does not remove your trials, it's because he doesn't love you. But that is a lie. It's been repeated since the beginning of time. It's a lie that believes that nothing is to be gained from the presence of trials and suffering. And it belittles the power of God to leverage your trials into something wonderful. Did trials mean that Jesus doesn't care? 1 Peter 5 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. During times of trial, may I encourage you, do not believe the lie that God does not care. The cross should dispel that notion immediately and completely. Rather, turn your thoughts to him, the one who cares for you, and the one who's decreed the trials for your good. Third application. Related to this, I want to consider how we should not apply the text. Whereas we might be tempted to use these texts as a means of encouraging people to pray that Jesus will take away our storms. Uh, the, the, The message here is that when you have a storm, pray that Jesus would remove the storm and he'll remove the storm. But I don't think that's the message here. Jesus did not calm the storm because the disciples believed. He calmed the storm because they didn't believe. Jesus removed the storm to show them that he can, to give them a clearer picture of who it is in the boat with them. But he doesn't always remove storms. We know from Paul, the great apostle was shipwrecked three or four times. His faith did not stop the storms. We're told again by Paul that when he experienced some kind of thorn in the flesh, God told him that he would not remove it because God would be glorified through it. And so Paul embraced the thorn the thorn, the storm. We're told in Psalm 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The valley didn't disappear. The psalmist learned to walk through it because he knew God was with him. Wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't it be better to be able to walk through a storm, to walk through a valley of the shadow of death, rather than just have them all removed? What does God promise? He he promises his presence. He promises that he will be with us and he will sustain us through the storm. The storm is not without purpose. He promises that he can and will use the storm in our lives to make us stronger. James 1, Romans 5, and many other passages, Romans 8. He's going to make us more like Christ, and it takes storms to get there. There's no shortcut. Fourth, Let's take a moment and look at Jesus' rebuke of the disciples. He asked them the question, how is it that you have no faith? Of course, Jesus is not merely asking, or merely, uh, uh, not asking for merely faith, uh, as in faith in something or anything. He was asking why they don't put their faith in him. But what about you? You can smirk at the disciples for not trusting Jesus. But if you, you have the completed canon of God and the work of the Holy Spirit and the new covenant. Do you trust him? If not, what are you doing about it? I might suggest if you want to strengthen your faith, it's not just a matter of telling yourself, I need to have more faith, I need to have more faith. You need to focus your attention on the object of your faith, on the Lord himself. We are to get a bigger and bigger picture of Christ, and when we do, our faith will grow. And it won't happen with five-minute devotionals and dark prayers. Our faith will grow and our knowledge of Christ will expand when we are serious to devote our time, our hearts, our minds, and our wills to him in prayer and faithful attendance at church and sitting under the preaching of the word and daily personal time and study and marinating in the truths of scripture and in reading the books that direct us 
into the mystery and wonder of Christ and the deep things of God. Fifth and finally, we noted earlier that we are not to conclude that Jesus will still all our storms because we pray or have faith. But at the same time, let's be reminded of how Jesus addressed these problems and learned something about him that will give us hope and comfort. Notice in neither of these cases was there ever any doubt of who would win. In both the storm and the demons, we witness the absolute mastery and authority of Jesus. When he tells the storm to stop, there's no pushback, there's no negotiating. And even when the demons try to negotiate, it's out of absolute fear that he will destroy them. The point is that it's not just that Jesus has power over them, but that he has absolute power. The storm stills immediately. The demons run away as fast as they can. They flee at his command. It's not about Jesus' superiority over storms. His power and choice to use storms to bring about his purposes is the point. Be encouraged that one day God will be done with the storms. But in the meantime... We are to live facing those storms, embracing them for the work that Jesus has in mind for us, recognizing that he's in the boat with us, that he has absolute control over. He will bring storms in our life and he'll remove them at his will for his good, for his glory, and for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you are so gracious to reveal to us that you love us, that you care for us, and that even in the midst of these struggles and trials, that you care, that you are orchestrating them for a purpose, and that we are to learn to trust you in the midst of that. I pray this morning as we reflect on these truths that you will drive them into our hearts and help us to walk away with a greater sense of appreciation and love and thankfulness for all that you've done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close by singing, standing and singing together hymn number 351, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Hymn 351.
Just a few reminders. We want to invite you to come and join us for a time of fellowship. If you are a visitor, we invite you to come and be a part of the Visitor Sunday School class. Pastor Dodds will be uh, teaching back in the training room, uh, covering the topic of God's sovereignty. Uh, Also, if you are high school youth, you'll be back in here in the sanctuary for the psalm study uh, with Mr. Clark. Uh, And um, and then again, be back tonight at 6 p.m. as we close out the Lord's Day in worship. Now receive the Lord's blessing, his benediction. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.